love you. Amen. Our Amen. Our guests, we're, glad guests. You're here. we're glad you're here. Amen. We appreciate Amen. it. We appreciate it. Lord is good. Lord is good. Yes. Sunday school class. Yes. Sunday school classes. You can go. Amen. Amen. I feel the Holy Ghost. I feel the today. Holy Ghost today. Yes. If anyone needs if the anyone Holy Ghost, needs the Holy you Ghost, can, get the Holy you can get the Holy Ghost. Ghost. Hallelujah. We Hallelujah. believe in receiving believe in the, the baptism, baptism of the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost. evidenced by Evidence speaking by in other speaking tongues. In other tongues. Oh, Hallelujah. Jesus. Jesus, Jesus. Thank you all for being here today. We appreciate that so much. If you're watching on YouTube, we thank you for allowing us to come into your home. We trust that you'll be blessed for watching and listening. You that are being here today, we're just thrilled to have you. Matthew chapter 26, verse 14. Matthew 26, verse 14. Then one of the twelve, called Judas Iscariot, went unto the chief priest said unto them, What will ye give me? And I will deliver him unto you. And they covered that with him for thirty pieces of silver. And from that time he sought opportunity to betray him. Now the first day of the feast of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus, saying unto him, Where wilt thou that we prepare for thee to eat the Passover? In other words, where you want to eat at? And he said, Go into the city to such a man, and say unto him, The master saith, My time is at hand, and I will come, or I will keep the Passover at thy house with my disciples. And the disciples did as Jesus had appointed them, and they made ready the Passover. And when the even was come, he sat down with the twelve. And as they did eat, he said, Verily I say unto you, that one of you shall betray me. And they were exceeding sorrowful. Began every one of them to say unto the Lord, Lord, is it I? And he answered and said, He that dippeth his hand with me in the dish, the same shall betray me. The Son of Man goeth as it is written of him. But woe unto that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It had been good for that man if he had not been born. Then Judas, which betrayed him, answered and said, Master, is it I? And he saith unto him, Thou hast said. Thou hast said. Jesus at supper told him, Somebody's going to betray me. And all the disciples asked him and said, Is it I? And then finally, towards the end of the meal, when Judas was sitting there, Judas looked at him and said, Master, is it me? And he said, You said. And so twice there they asked the question, Is it I? Brother Hubert mentioned today while he was leading the service that it's about the Lord. But I want to ask the question today, what about me? What about me? What about me? What about me? Let's raise our hands one more time and thank the Lord for this privilege. Dear Lord Jesus, we love you today. Dear God, we thank you, Lord, for being here today, for worshiping you. Lord, we thank you, dear God, for allowing us to be here in your house. Thank you, God. Anoint us and let us do good so we can bring the word of the Lord in a way, God, that it will edify you and bless you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. And everybody said amen. God bless you. You may be seated. It's, we talked last week as we are in our Easter season of lessons how that there was a time they were at Simon the leper's house and they were there with Jesus and in the middle of that meal. It seems like there's a couple things we find out about Jesus. They're always talking thinking Jesus can't hear and they're always doing it at a dinner time. 
and Jesus is there with them and they are eating and Mary came in and she broke that alabaster box and she poured it all over his feet and his head and they, they got all upset about it and Jesus rebuked them and we talked about that last week and so then after they left that sitting and that situation, Jesus told his disciples, he said, it's time for us to do the Passover. And they said, well, where are we going to eat at? Where are we going to do this at? We need a place. None of us has got a house. So where do you want us to do this at? And so uh, he said, you go into the city, find a certain man and tell him that, that I'm ready and we're going to go sit down and we're going to have a meal and that's where we'll do this at. So they go into the city and some Bible scholar believes it's the same guy that, that they confiscated, if I can use that term, or the man who loaned Jesus the donkey to ride, that that's, they went back to him and said, the master's ready to do the Passover now. He's ready to come to your house and have the Passover. So the man got the room ready and told him, said, you can go there. Amen. You can go you can go to that. I don't know what kind of place it was. I don't have any idea what type of place it was. I remember the first trip that I made to Vietnam. We were supposed to have a big dinner with a bunch of young people that were graduating and the government found out about it. And they shut it down and said, if you go there, we'll arrest you all. And so we started looking for a place to have it. And we found a man who was sympathetic to Christians in this big city. And they had a big, tall, three-story building. And he had a third-story room that was about the size of this church that he kept dressed up just like a church. It had a platform about like this. It had a podium on it. It had places for musicians. And it had chairs. And the bottom of it was a karaoke bar. And the middle was the kitchen for the karaoke bar. And on the top, we had, we had a graduation. And we had like a Bible school graduation. And we had church. And we sang and preached and brought the meal in. And soon as we got done, all of us Americans left. And they said, why are we, I said, why are we leaving? My job was to be like the usher. I stood at the door and watched for the government officials to come. And the, jo- the, the missionary said, we'll leave. And if the government shows up, it's just a bunch of Vietnamese having a party. <laughs> Maybe that's what happened here. Maybe there were so many people against Jesus in his ministry that he was looking for a place to have it. And this man was sympathetic to Jesus and his cause. And he told him, he said, have it up here. Have it in this room. And so Jesus and his disciples, they go to this place and they go to this man's room and they they sit down and they have a meal as our picture shows. And they're having their meal and they're sitting around there. You know, some of the most revealing conversations we have are at the supper table. I'll just put this out there. You don't, have to, you, you don't have to agree with me on this at all, but I'm still a strong believer in the family table. I like having my meals with my family instead of them eating in their room or on the couch or in there. I like to sit around a table because it's, it's at that meal that sometimes one of them is going to look at you and say, hey, I need to tell you something. Or they're going to tell you about their day. Or they're going to open up a little bit to you. But in our busy world, we don't do so much of that anymore. But I really believe that some of the most revealing conversations we have are at a supper table. And I find it most interesting that that it was at this sitting that Jesus used this forum, if I can use that term, to institute the Lord's Supper as well as begin the end of His earthly ministry. And and all of a sudden, He just just kind of just told them how, the end is going to be and and this conversation began to deal with the with the prophecies concerning his death and his his uh, all the things that are going on and when the evening was come he sat down with these 12 disciples and and at this time he was showing them his lowliness and if you study all the gospel writers of it you'll find that they were showing him their pride he had washed their feet He had washed their feet. He had humbled himself before them and washed their feet. And then they begin to get into it and show the pride. And they begin to argue over who was going to be the greatest in the kingdom. Jesus is there washing their feet, showing a sign of humility. And they're they're wanting first chair. They're wanting to see who's going to be the greatest. Who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom? Who's going to do this? And and, and he washed their feet and and they argued over who was going to be the greatest. It seems strange to me that at, at that this type of pettiness to be seen at this critical hour. You know, there's there's a time, and, and I don't mean this in, in a in a don't don't anybody take what I'm saying in the wrong way, but there's a time for pettiness. 
when pettiness, you can get by with it. But then there's a time where you got to let the pettiness go because now we're down to critical mass. And now we're down to serious stuff. And there may have been a time when Jesus was picking his disciples where their personalities could rub off and they could get their pecking order and they could get it all in line. But this scene was not the place to let your pettiness and your little differences come out. But this was a time for everybody to realize the seriousness of the hour and what was going on. There was times for that. And this was not the time. And they argued over who was going to be the greatest. And he warns them of the coming cross. And while he was telling them about the coming of the cross, they argued about who was going to, going to be one of the biggest stars in the show. It was showing their pride. You see, pride is one of the most deadly spiritual enemies that we don't hear a lot about. But it, over the years and over the centuries, pride has caused more problems in the church than, than almost anything else. Amen. We all feel it in our own lives. We all feel the struggle. We all feel that. But, but when there comes a point, there's a difference between feeling good about yourself than thinking you're better than you are. Amen. It's okay. I really believe in feeling good about yourself. I believe in realizing who you are in Jesus Christ and feeling good in yourself. But when you do what the Bible says, when you puff yourself up, when you think you're a little better than somebody else. You know, I go to a restaurant. I want my server. I want my server to be clean. I want my server to be professional. I want the best server that they've got. But I don't want my server to think she is better than the meal. I think we ought to do the best we can and be all we can and give Jesus Christ our best. But I don't think there's any place in the kingdom of God for the pride to come in to where I can puff myself up and think I'm a little better than somebody else. There's no place for that. And the disciples struggled with that. And that pride is still evident in our world today. But pride has to be done away with if we're going to follow Jesus. And that's not even what I'm preaching on this morning. But as he was teaching them about humble us, he sat there at that meal and he dropped a bombshell on them. They're all sitting around, who's going to be the greatest? And they're, they're passing the biscuits and they're waiting on the dessert and, and they're laughing and they're talking and one of them's hugging Jesus and John's got his head on Jesus' chest and, and then they're over there talking about this and I bet you that when we come into the kingdom, I'll bet you I'll get to be next to Jesus. I'll be like the assistant Messiah. And then Peter says, I got the keys. He already told me I had the keys. I don't know what that means yet, but I got them. So I'll know someday. I don't understand that, but I've got them. And they, can you imagine what they're going on? I'm going to get a position. It's like going to a meeting and they're all shaking hands with people they never shook hands with before because they're wanting that position and they're wanting that vote. And they're just buddying up because we don't know if he's going to have election. And as things get a little bit quiet, Jesus just very calmly, and all of a sudden he says, you know, one of you all are going to betray me. I bet you could have heard a pin drop there for a little bit. One of you all are going to betray me. He said, you're going to, you're going to betray me. But I believe that when he spoke that, he, he spoke it not only in sorrow, but he spoke it in love. It, it, there's sometimes we say things to the people that we love that breaks our heart to have to tell them, but we love them and we say it in love and we say it in sorrow as well. And I don't believe Jesus looked at them with squinted eyes and just looked at them with, an, with a tone of accusation or a tone of, of condemnation. But I believe he said it in love and I believe he said it in sorrow. And he just looked at them and he said, you know, guys, <laughs> one of you guys are going to turn on me. One of you guys are going to betray me. One of you are going to turn me in. He spoke it in sorrow and well as love. And he may, even been, he, he may have even been calling Judas to repentance. And he tried that with the hard-hearted Jews. And the hard-hearted Jews wouldn't listen to him. And Judas sat near him. And when he said, all of you, somebody's going somebody's to betray me in this group. And it never touched Judas's heart. I won't read it, but in Luke 22 and 3, he had yielded to Satan and his, his chances were now passed. And at this point, the disciples begin to ask the question because all of their bickering stopped. 
It was no longer who was the big shot in the church. It was no longer who was the head minister. It was no longer who had the keys and who was going to be the assistant and who was going to be the treasurer and who was going to be that and who was going to get to go here and who was going to go there. There was none of that, but it all stopped. The bickering stopped. And it began to turn to sorrow. And every one of them looked at him in the face and said, Lord, is it me? Is it me? Is it me? Can you imagine sitting in that room with just you and 11 other people and Jesus himself, and he just looks out over the crowd and says, says one of you are going to betray me. Now, I'm going to say something here just so you kind of understand what I'm talking about. We don't have any, we're not having, for our guests here, we're not having church trouble. I'm just using this as an example. But it would be like me getting up here this morning and say, one of you families are going to split this church wide open. One of you are going to get so mad at me over something. That's not happening. That's not prophetic. I'm just using it so you can kind of understand what the mood in the room would be. If I would have stood up there this morning and said, appreciate everybody being here, but I just want you to know, one of you families have already started the process of busting up this church. That's not happening. That's not happening. I'm just using that as an example. Can you imagine? Because you know what? You know what every one of us would do? Every one of us would look at our spouses or somebody near us and go, it ain't us. Ain't us, is it, huh? <laughs> we, 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 we. And everybody would have started... That's the time nobody would have bobbed their head up and down. Everybody would have went, nah, -uh, no, not me, not me. And everybody looked at him and all the, oh, John looked at him and said, is it me? All the other disciples, they looked and said, is it me? Can you imagine? That'll ruin a meal. You're right in the middle of a meal and Jesus just stops and says, one of you, one of you are going to, Betray me. Oh, it ain't important now who's the big shot. We got to identify this problem. We got to fix it. And then and, and he said, is it me? And they began then, at that time, they began to feel Jesus' sorrow. You know, none of them answered like Peter later did with a passionate plea of the faithful when Peter stood up and declared, I will never. You know the same tone of voice he said that with is the people who stand up and say, my kids will never. <laughs> my kids will never act like that. Maybe not when you're around, sweetheart. But don't ever let them out of your sight. Don't ever let them grow up because they'll, they'll come back to bite you. It'll kick you. Not my kids. No. Peter said, I'll never. If they're going to kill you, they're going to have to kill me. If they're going to hang you, they'll hang me. And Peter went all through that. And the Lord just kind of looked at him and said, calm down, big guy. Calm down, big guy. Because you're going to do it someday, Peter, but maybe not here. But that was a different situation. But Peter had that passion to play. Not me. Not me. Not me. Not me. All of a sudden, the crowd went, the, the, the conversation went from boisterous and bickering and arguing. It went from all of those type of things. All of a sudden, they, they, they just began to whisper. And their talk had a tremble to it. And anxiety and self-distrust. Because they didn't know if they could trust Him. And they didn't know, not Jesus, but they didn't know if they could trust the person next to them. And they, they didn't even know at that point whether they can trust themselves. They didn't know if they could trust themselves. And they whispered with trembling talk and anxiety and self-distrust. And, and all of a sudden, there was probably some quivers in their voices. And, and, and they, they never asked the question. That I found it so interesting. They never asked the question if it was someone else. They never looked around. And there's no record where James looked over and said, Peter, is it you? And Peter went, not me, is it you? How about, there was nobody sitting there going, I bet it's Matthew, he's a tax collector, he's about half crooked anyway. <laughs> he works for the IRS. He's a, 
You can't trust an IRS man. <laughs> John says, I'll bet it's Matthew. No, they didn't say that. There was nobody went through the list and down through the list and went through there. I'll bet it's this one. I'll bet it's that one. No, because you know what every one of them was? Because every one of them realized the criticalness of the hour and they realized the criticalness of the situation and every one of them turned their eyes inward and every one of them asked him and said, Is it me? Is it me? Is it me? What about, what about me, Lord? What about me? Is it, is it going to be me? And as they begin to feel that, they begin to ask their question. And they never asked a question. It was someone else. But they simply asked the question. And they said, is it me? Jesus didn't point it out. He just said that somebody here at this room, and he said they had things going that, you know, we may do it at home, but... I'm not real comfortable doing it everywhere else where we all eat out of the same bowl. You know, we may dip our mashed potatoes out of the same bowl at home, but I don't like going into those restaurants where they have family style, where they set you down by strangers you don't know and put mashed potatoes and all that stuff out there for everybody and say, there you go, and a big, I'm not into that. Maybe you are, God bless you, but I'm not into that. But in their day, Jesus said, yeah, he said, it's, there's, Somebody in this room, and they said, how are we going to know which one it is? Jesus said, it's, it's the one who dips with me. When we take our bread and we dip it in the sauce, and we dip it in the gravy, it's the one whose hand. I guarantee you, I, I, I shouldn't say I guarantee you, but I'd like to think, Brother Jones, that if that was me, I'd put my hands in my pockets. If he said, whoever dips with me, I'd throw my bread away. I'd eat my bread dry. I'd put my hands in my pocket. I'd set on my hands. I'd grab a hold of that table, Brother Richard, like we used to hang on to pews when we were kids. And we'd get under conviction. And we'd hang on to them pews. And we'd start thinking everything we could to keep ourselves from being under conviction. And we'd just hang on. I'd hang on to that pew, Brother White. I'd have hung on to something. I'd have said, I'm not letting my hands go. I'd have doubled up a fist. You couldn't have given me a piece of bread. Get that gravy to the other end of the table. Get it completely away from me. I don't want anything to do with it I'm not supping today but that goofy Judas as soon as he said whoever sups with me and Jesus took his hand old Jesus just reached out there and just took his hand thinking dear Lord how could you do that Jesus done everything he could to stop him but the only thing Jesus didn't do was he never overrode Judas's free will. He never overrode his free will. When that hand started to grab that bread and Judas headed for that bowl, Jesus could have withered that hand up and just spoke that hand. He could have changed his thought. He could have knocked him on the floor. He could have knocked him down. He could have put him in a trance. He could have stopped him. He could have done everything in his power, but he left his free will because there's one thing that God requires out of me in my worship and in my service. It has to be because I want to. It has to be because I want to. I have never seen the Holy Ghost grab somebody by the back of the neck and pick them up in the air and them floundering in space, screaming, no, no, no. And God slammed them down at the altar and say, you're going to do it. But everybody I've ever seen come walking down to the altar has got up off of their feet on their own free will and said, I want to follow Jesus. I want to follow Jesus. And they walk down to that altar. We've never grabbed people and hogtied them and threw them in a baptistry in Jesus' name. But everybody that I've ever baptized has came and said, Pastor, I want to be baptized in Jesus' name because there's something about surrender of our free will. Judas used his free will and he grabbed the bread Finally, he, he just got to wonder about the guy. Whoever slips with me, he'll betray me. And in my mind, I can see him sitting there with a half a biscuit 
and just taking it and dipping that gravy in. Going, Is it me? <laughs> Why would you dip if he said, Whoever dips with me? Whoever rides the truck with me today on the way to town, you're the one that's going to betray me. I couldn't pay anybody in here to get in that truck with me. I ain't, I'll walk. I'll walk to the house. I'll hitchhike. I ain't, whoever rides in that truck with me today is going to split this church wide open. You ain't getting in that truck, but that goofy Judas, when he says, whoever sups with me, he just takes a big old swab of gravy on the bread and says, is it me? you got to wonder about the guy. And Jesus just looks at him and said, Well, you said it. You said it. You said it. And when I read that this week and I began to study that, it really got a hold of my heart. Because Judas asked, he said, Is it me? And Jesus said, You have said. And I, I just, I wanted to know what it really means to betray the Lord. Because as I've already said, there's not a one of us who would take a piece of bread and dip it in the gravy bowl of Jesus if we thought that was going to seal our doom and we would be forever doomed as Judas was. None of us would. So I looked up the word of betray or to betray or betrayal. And the definitions of betray means to be unfaithful in guarding. To be unfaithful in guarding. To, to be unfaithful in maintaining or fulfilling. Another definition is to disappoint in the hopes or expectation. That's a secular dictionary. That was not a biblical dictionary. But it means to, to betray. To means to be unfaithful in your guarding. The Bible tells us that we need to guard our hearts. To guard our minds. To guard our thoughts. To guard our minds. To guard ourselves. We have to be on guard. God has given us like He gave to Judas. He gave Judas one of the greatest blessings He could ever give someone. He handpicked him and put him in the twelve. But Judas was unfaithful in his guarding. He was unfaithful. He was unfaithful in maintaining. He was unfaithful in his fulfilling. He was disappointing when it comes to the hopes or the expectations that he had. You see, he was given that greatest blessing. Can you imagine being handpicked by Jesus to come and be a part of the original twelve? You see, we talk about Judas and we think about Judas as Judas just being the betrayer and how he turns Jesus in for 30 pieces of silver and he goes and hangs himself and dies and, and, and all that gruesomeness of all of that when his guilt begins to, to overpour him. But when you look back before this ever happened, Judas was one of the two, uh, that one of the group that Jesus sent out two by two. You know what Judas had done? Judas had laid hands on people and cast devils out of them. Jesus, Judas, excuse me, had prayed for people and they had been healed. It was Judas who was also asleep in the boat when Jesus came walking on the water. Judas was there when they saw Jesus walking on the water and he bid Peter to come out. Judas was in that same boat. Judas was walking with them when Jesus reached up and touched Jairus' daughter and she came alive again. It was Judas as much as it was Peter who was standing there as much as Peter, James, and John. Judas was right there and he saw it all. You know, the Bible says that one time there was people that were, that were uh, hungry and Jesus didn't want them to go away. And you know the story of how he took the fishes and the loaves and he multiplied it. And when he got all done, he sent the disciples and they brought back 12 baskets full. So you know what that means? That means Judas held in his hand a basket that received the miraculous blessings of the fishes and loaves. It was Judas who carried a basket and saw what Jesus could do. 
But somewhere down the line, he failed to guard. He failed to guard. You see, it was Judas last week who, who got all bent out of shape first and said, we could have sold that and gave that to the poor. Jesus said, shut it up, fellas. You're always going to have the poor. You just got about four more days with me. We covered that last week. But it was Judas who failed to guard. It was Judas who failed to guard. It was Judas who failed to maintain. I believe in spiritual disciplines. I think that we have to do, we have to be serious enough because we have to realize what God has placed in earthen vessels. God put His Spirit on the inside of us and gave us His name and puts it on the inside of us and we have to maintain that. You can't just get it today and then go live in la-la land and be goofy about it and not care about it or you'll lose it and you'll betray it by failing to maintain it. And... That's why you got to pray and you got to fast and you got to read your Bible and you got to be faithful to coming to church. You can't just be sporadic about any of those type of things. You got you got to maintain it or you'll betray it. We've got hopes and expectations. We can't disappoint in those hopes and those expectations. Now he stands among those. He stands among those in the hallway of life that's too late. You know, I've heard so many times all my life when we start talking about everybody needs Jesus, everybody needs Jesus, everybody needs Jesus. And we start talking about that and, and somebody always goes, well, what about the Indians that were here before Jesus came? And what about the, what about the people in the middle of Africa that never hear about Jesus? That's up to them. Your responsibility is not to the aborigines living out in the middle of Australia. Your responsibility today is you. And if we have one thing lacking in our world today outside of these four walls, it's the acceptance of personal responsibility. It's not my neighbor's responsibility to make sure that my house is maintained and my yard is mowed. That's my responsibility. It's not the, oh, I, I, can I just talk a minute? It's not the state's responsibility to make sure that my children and my grandchildren, that no, 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 no. The Lord tells me that, that as a man, I'm supposed to, as a family, we're supposed to, we're supposed to take care of those things. Yeah, and, and we have a, a lacking in our world today of personal responsibility. It's never their fault. It's never their fault. If you got a problem, you can go get it diagnosed and then and, and they'll, they'll bring it all. If they got to go back five generations, they will to prove that the reason you like you are is because of somebody else's mistake. And I'm sorry, but I'm just weary of that. There comes a point where, as Jesus said, and where his disciples asked him and asked a question and said, Is it me? Is it me? Is it me? What about me? Forget the man in the middle of the Aborigines. Forget about the man living in China and Vietnam and Thailand and, and, and Togo and Benin and, and, and Hong Kong and all those other... Forget the man who's living in the inner city of Chicago and L.A. What about you? What are you doing with what you've been given? What are you doing with what you know? What are you given with what you've been blessed with? What are you been given with what God has given you? What are you doing with yours? He stands among those with no hope. Unfaithful disappointed in his expectations of fulfilling what God had called him to do. What a, what a way to end it, Judas. 
You watched Jesus walk on water. You watched him land on the shore and saw the demoniac come running out, saying, Son of David, have mercy on me. And you've seen Jesus answer the prayer of a legion of demons when the demons said, We don't want to go into outer darkness. Where do you want to go? Send us to the pigs. And Jesus did that. It was Judas who stood there and watched him. So I'm going to ask you a question, and I'm wrapping this up. How will we stand someday when we've sat in church service after church service after church service and heard the need to live right? And we've, we've heard the need to repent of our sins and to be baptized in Jesus' name and to receive the Holy Ghost. And some of us have done that. And we've worshipped God and felt the glory of God. We've felt the power of God. Some of us have been healed. We've had God's hand reach down and touch us and heal us. We've had people smear oil on our head, Brother Steve, and pray for us. And God has healed us. We've had God open doors and provide miraculous things for us. We've sat in church service after church service and seen God do some amazing things. And then, if we're not careful, we'll not guard what God has given us to the place that someday we'll stand like Judas and wish we had one more time at the table. Give me one more time at the table. One more time at the table. And when they pass that sup, I'll throw my biscuit across the room. Oh, Judas had to look at Peter and John and all those guys going with Jesus and saw it all getting ready to happen. And he had to think, what big a fool was I? What kind of fool was I? I sat in the boat with him. I walked with him. I talked with him. He used me. He blessed me. He called me. He gave me everything I needed. I saw him do all of these things and I walked out the door. What about me? Paul said his greatest fear was not of dying it was not of being stoned. It was not of being persecuted. But you know what? Shane, hand me that bottle. You know what Paul's greatest fear was? Thank you, sir. You know what Paul's greatest fear was? Paul's greatest fear was that after he had given himself to God and God had used him, that he himself... would be a castaway. Brother Jones, you know what my greatest fear is? 45 years in the ministry and not guarding it. Not guarding the ministry, but not guarding my personal walk with God. It ain't all about the preaching. Because you see, I'm thirsty and this bottle's got what I need. And when I take a drink of that, but what am I going to do with it? When it's all gone, I'm going to throw it away. I'll, I'll, I'll discard it. So I just got to ask you this simple question this morning. What about you? What about you? What about you? We are living in a parallel time to what was going on in Jesus' day. Because they had a lot of time for frivolous stuff. But they were down to crunch time. They, 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 were, they, could, they could argue over who was going to be first and who was going to do this and who was going to do that and who was going to be this and who was going to be that. They had all kinds of time to talk about that. 
But Jesus, when he called them around the table, he said, now that's over with, boys. It's crunch time. It's show time. It's get real time. And somebody's going to betray me.